Good morning. I hope you noticed on the front of the bulletin the caricature of the little kitten and the mirror because that's what we look like when we show up as our authentic selves. We might feel meek and mild and little, but when we look in that mirror, what we should see is a tiger, a tiger. And just like Millie said, how wonderful life is because you're in the world. And I thank God for all of you. There were 14 of us who ventured out on a Spirit at Sea cruise, and a lot of Unity folks had a great time. We had workshops, and I bring you greetings from Reverend Heidi Alfrey, who used to be here. She's doing well. She did an excellent workshop. We're all still growing from that. When I was in my 20s, I would ask this important question. And I bet you remember asking this question in your 20s. Those of you who are still in your 20s are probably still asking this question. What am I here for? Now that I'm middle age, I stand in the refrigerator and ask that same question. <laughs> in fact, I ask it when I go to the downstairs, when I go to the bathroom, when I go to the bedroom, when I go to the living room. It's what am I here for? What was that I was supposed to be doing? <laughs> so Duke has started a series the past two Sundays on mindfulness. And the first two, he talked about, who's that talking in your head? You know those voices that we hear all the time saying, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, you didn't do this right, you never should do that. And then he talked about, last week, taming that inner critic. We all have that. I'm not as good as I ought to be, I'm not enough, I don't have enough, I'm not good enough. We all have that inner critic. And sometimes it comes from things we've heard about ourselves, Sometimes things we think about ourselves. That's what you call sin, error thinking. Duke shared an example of how when he was growing up, he had a speech impediment, and it made him self-conscious. And so he was afraid to get up in front of anybody and speak. And he overcame that by changing his mind about who he is and what he can do. Now, when I was a lot younger, in my 20s, I grew up with a wide gap between my front teeth, my two front teeth. And I would get teased all the time about that gap. You can drive a truck through your front teeth. I would hear that a lot. I would go home crying and wishing, my brother and sister just had these perfect teeth, and I wanted teeth like theirs. So when I turned 21 and my first big paycheck, I went to my dentist and I said, I want you to close this gap. My dentist, Dr. Tom Jones, said to me, Sandra, I can close the gap, but that's not it. It's what you think about yourself that is getting in your way. There's nothing wrong with your gap. As a matter of fact, it's beautiful. But if you want me to close it, I'll do it. He sawed down two perfectly good teeth into nubs. Now, that's how desperate I was. And then put caps over my teeth that were much larger than my teeth, but it closed that gap. Years later, when I realized who I am, and I became more consciously aware that I am God's whole and perfect child, and I'm beautiful just the way I am, I went back to Dr. Jones, and I said, I want my gap back. <laughs> now, that might sound funny, but he did it. He narrowed the, the size of the two teeth in front. He made two smaller teeth and brought back my gap. And my brother said to me, He's 11 years older, and, you know, you don't always tell your sister what you really think, right? But my brother said to me one day, I, I don't know why you closed your gap. It was just so beautiful. Had I heard that when I was younger, instead of listening to those voices, those negative voices saying, you know, you could drive a truck through those teeth, or that, boy, your, that gap is wide, or that's a lie gap. I heard that a lot. If you have a gap, you know, people say you lie, right? That's a lie gap. I used to hear that. But once I decided to be who I am, and Dr. Jones was able to work his magic, I was quite satisfied to be exactly as I came here to be. So I'm going to talk to you about that, this mindfulness. Psychology Today says mindfulness is a state of active, open attention to the present moment. By observing your thoughts and your feelings from a distance, you become the observer without judging them as good or bad. 
So my lesson today is what you think about, you bring about. Now, the more I thought about that gap and how horrible I looked, the worse I saw myself. When I would look in the mirror, I would see staring back at me this huge, huge gap. A big gap between who I really was and those negative tapes that were playing in my head. Anybody in here have negative tapes playing in your head sometimes? Yeah. So what do you do about it? Today, I'm not going to try to build you a watch. You know, if you ask me what time it is, sometimes I'll tell you that, well, according to this watch, but on Eastern time, it's such and such. But today, I'm not going to build you the watches you get when some people ask a question and they tell you the whole story. But I'm going to start with a simple analogy of how I want to do this lesson. And it goes back to my husband, Phil. Before he retired, he was trying not to take any time off work. And so he wouldn't take off for anything. Well, my car was making a noise. So I called him. I said, hey, Phil, this car is making a noise. I get petrified about anything mechanical because I have no idea what to do about it. And then when I go do something on my own, he says, I, I spent too much. I let them, you know, talk me into doing things that I shouldn't have done. So I called him first. Hey, it's making a noise. He said, come by on my lunch hour. I'll take it around the parking lot and we'll see. Because he's very mechanical. So he drives it around the parking lot and he says, okay. Take it to the mechanic, and this is what I want you to say. I want you to tell him that the timing is off. And I want you to tell him that it's prematurely detonating. And I want you to tell him that that may damage the valves. Now, make sure you tell him exactly what I said. I said, okay, the timing's off, it's premature detonating, and it may damage the vial, valves, valves, right? Valves, I'm not mechanical. So, I go to the mechanic. I'm really smart. I've got this newfound mechanical wisdom. I said, I know exactly what's wrong with my car. I'm going to tell you just like it is. It's making this funny noise, but that's not the problem. <laughs> it's premature detonating. Oh, yeah, and the timing is off, and that may damage the, vo the valves. And I just knew he was going to praise me and tell me, wow, you must be a mechanic. You really know, you know your stuff. As I was looking over his shoulder, very smugly waiting for him to compliment me, I saw that he wrote, lady says her car is making a noise. <laughs> <laughs> so today for my lesson, I learned from the mechanic, keep it short, simple, and to the point. So that's what I'm going to do. So when I was writing this talk this week, I was thinking about what Duke has been talking about. And what jumped off the page at me was from Romans, the 12th chapter, the second verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now that is attributed to the Apostle Paul. Let me just give you a little history about the Apostle Paul. because He wrote some very witty things in the New Testament. His name was Saul, and he was from Tarsus. Tarsus, metaphysically, which is how we interpret scripture, beyond the physical or literal meaning, stands for an area of intellect. He was well-educated. By our standards today, we might say, they said he was like a police officer, but he was a bounty hunter. And his job was to find all the people who followed the way. Now, in case you don't know what the way is, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So those who followed after Jesus were called the way, the way followers. He was the way shore. This is after his crucifixion and resurrection. So Paul is persecuting Christians. Saul, rather, is persecuting Christians. Christians, that was his job. And he stands for the will. And he was a very willing, willing to get out there and do his job. Probably known as the best bounty hunter in the land. He prided himself on gathering all the Christians and throwing them into jail. And he is said to have not only witnessed but may have participated in the, first perse the persecution of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Watched him being stoned to death and maybe cast a few stones himself. They say he never really knew Jesus, though he grew up in the same time as Jesus, but he never took the opportunity. He just believed whatever he was told. And so he followed 
the guidance he was given. On this particular day, he and a group of friends, on their way to collect more of the way show, the way people, fell down as if something struck them. They were on the road to Damascus to enlightenment. And when Saul fell, a flash of light came, and it blinded him. And a voice out of nowhere said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who is that? This is Jesus. Why do you persecute me? And Saul was scared. Probably thought, I'm a dead man now. This guy is back. And then he told Saul to get up and go into Jerusalem where he was already headed. He carried a letter in his pocket that was his command from his high commander to go to Jerusalem and gather up more of people who followed the way and cast them into prison. So that's where he was headed anyway. He told him to go to Jerusalem, Jesus speaking, and find this man called Ananias, and he will heal him from his blindness. The light left Saul blind. Now, some theologians say that Saul could have suffered a stroke or some kind of physical impairment that caused him to lose his sight or fall. But I believe he was experiencing what we call an epiphany of revelation. So his friends take him into Jerusalem and take him to the home of Ananias. Ananias, around the same time, I believe that Saul had that experience with the light, also had an epiphany when Jesus spoke to him and said, there's going to be a man coming to your home, and he's going to need healing, and his name is Saul, and I want you to lay hands on and heal him from his blindness. And Ananias said, no way. That's the man that's coming to kill us. He's coming to throw us in jail. You want me to heal him so he can kill, throw us in jail? He says, no, no, no. I have another plan for him. He's going to find a new way. He's going to go in a different direction. He's going to heal. He's going to teach. He's going to spread the good news. And so when Saul arrived at Ananias' home, Ananias did as, as he was commanded by Jesus to lay his hands on and heal Saul of his blindness. And his name was changed to Paul. Paul is credited with writing the majority of the New Testament. His works appear in the epistles are the letters to the various churches that he went around to tell about this new belief system that he had acquired through this experience, this light that came on. He no longer conformed to the laws of the land that all Christians needed to be persecuted, but he was transformed by the renewing of his mind. That road to Damascus experience is not unlike experiences we have every day. This is Black History Month, and when I think about the road to Damascus experience, I can't help but to think about John Newton, who penned the words to the song Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a soul like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. See, John Newton was on another road to Damascus on a ship carrying slaves from Africa. And when a storm arose on that sea, John knew that they were going to all perish, and he prayed that if God would just save them, he would turn that ship around, take them back to their homeland. He would never engage in the slave trade again, and he would spend the rest of his life as an abolitionist. God answered his prayer, and John Newton became one of the greatest abolitionists in the history of the world. He had a road to Damascus experience. Now, I don't have time to discuss all of the road to Damascus experiences that I've had in my life, but trust me, there have been many. I conformed to the world until I learned that I was bigger than even I thought myself to be. When we stand here, on this day, as every single Sunday, we're not talking to you. We're talking to ourselves. Duke and I are reading our own mail. And you know what happens to you when you read your own mail? Sometimes you have so much mail that you can't 
get through it all, right? And if you use a computer, you know that there are constantly windows that are opening up. And you're trying to read everything, and you get distracted. And then you conform to this technology. Sometimes I get up in the morning, I'm on my computer, and all these windows are open, and I'm so excited, and next thing you know, it's evening, and I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> Where does the time go when you're distracted? But what Paul did was he stepped back from that distraction that had him captive to persecuting people. And he saw life in a different way. And because of him, we can read these stories and not only be inspired, but be guided by them. Because the Bible, as Unity's textbook, is simply the story of our own conscious evolution. See, we're talking about consciousness and subconsciousness and superconsciousness. What we're conscious of goes on right in front of us. We're aware of it. We know it's there. We can see it. We taste it. We touch it. Our subconscious tells us those things that we've always heard about ourselves and what we hold on to about other people that may or may not be true, those tapes that keep running over and over. And then our superconscious is when we finally close all those windows that are open on our computer and we step back, we turn it off, we let go, we breathe, and we listen to the voice of spirit. And then we have that road to Damascus experience because what you think about you bring about and in unity speak thoughts held in mind produce after their kind now the story of Paul is not a story of a straight line it's a story of a lot of twists and turns because like Paul he was human like us and sometimes we're on the straight path and we're doing just great and all the affirmations and denials are working and we're meditating and we're praying and our life just seems to be going in perfect order. And then all of a sudden, something happens and we resort back to those old ways of thinking. And we have to pull ourselves back. We have to keep repeating that practice. And it's an ongoing process. The Unity Movement was founded by Charles and Myrtle Fillmore in 1889. On this principle, one of five, that we create our reality through our thoughts. Now that doesn't mean we create our circumstances. It simply means we create the way we react, respond, and live within our circumstances through our thoughts. Through our thoughts. That's why we focus so much of our attention on prayer and meditation. It's the way we think about things that make all the difference between our lives being a heaven or a hell. So it's not what you are, what you look like, that is holding you back, like the gap between the teeth. It's what you think you are not. What you think you are not. So what are you? Are you a Saul? Or are you a Paul? What are you? As scripture tells us, do not be conformed to this world. How many of you are bombarded every single day by negative news? I turn on my computer and they pop up. And when you get these pop-ups, the thing to do is don't click on them. Don't entertain them. You see, our minds work the same way. You get pop-ups. And sometimes you need cookies and sometimes you don't need cookies. And <laughs> I don't get all the cookie stuff. But I know that you get pop-ups. And sometimes those pop-ups can destroy your memory in your computer. It's the same way with life. If we allow the pop-ups, the things that keep coming up in our subconscious mind to lead us, to guide us, to direct us, eventually we destroy our internal operating system, just like the computer. Denials and affirmations through our meditation process are the way to bring yourself back to click over and eliminate those pop-ups that threaten to destroy your peace, 
your joy, and your happiness. So I don't know how many of you don't use a computer and may not understand that kind of language, but it's simply that we are so distracted at times by everything that's going on around us that we tend to lose our focus. And as someone has said, if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So we have to prioritize what is mine to do. What Paul experienced do I want in my life? What am I here to be? That means you have to shut out the outer world from time to time. You have to go within yourself. Seek that higher consciousness. As we sing on Sundays, a state of peacefulness. And know that God is always there. And every thought becomes a prayer. As we move into meditation, I want you to hold that thought in your mind. Every thought is a prayer. So do not be conformed to what the world says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let us go within.